because I want to like react to this whole thing in proper fashion. Okay, but hey, everyone, welcome to the Blue Wings channel. Today, I'm going to be reacting to one of Bruce Lee's probably his only actual probably interview, to be honest. That's kind of done in like a full podcast format. Surprisingly, you know, especially considering back then, I don't think it was really podcasting. Probably wasn't that much of a thing back then. Or if it was, it was probably like in this very developmental stage, you know. And you know what's actually funny about this? I I literally came across this video, and I actually watched this video like a really long time ago, right? Like I don't even remember like a while back. And then I was I was like, you know, I was I was lately thinking about Bruce Lee and his philosophy of martial arts, right? And I was about to I was about to rewatch it and I'm like, wait, you know, why not give you guys some insight? Right. And in what I can see in what he says in terms of his philosophy or in terms of martial arts and just things in general. Right. So let's get to it. This is the Pierre Burton Show, Bruce Lee, Mandarin Superstar, production 1892, a recording December 9th, 1971, in Hong Kong. This was done in 1971, that's interesting. Because that's like, basically almost 50 years, or more than 50 years actually. It's crazy. Bruce Lee faces a real dilemma. He's on the verge of a stardom in the United States. First of all, we all know Bruce Lee doesn't face dilemma. Dilemmas face him. But carry on. With a projected TV series on the horizon, but he's just achieved superstardom as a film actor here in Hong Kong. So what does he choose? The East or the West? It's the kind of problem uh, most budding movie actors would welcome. It's interesting. He said East versus West, and he's got to choose. But does he not realize that every direction, mostly, I guess, like, owns it in a way? <laughs> it's the Pierre Burton Show, the program that comes to you from the major capitals of the world. This edition comes to you from Hong Kong. And Pierre's guest is the man who taught karate, judo, and Chinese boxing to James Garner, Steve McQueen, Lee Marvin, and James Coburn. The newest Mandarin superstar, known in the West for his appearances in Batman, The Green Hornet, Ironside, and Long Street. His name is Bruce Lee, and he doesn't even speak Mandarin. And here's Pierre. Well, how can you play in Mandarin movies if you don't even speak Mandarin? How do you do that? That is actually a good point, actually. <laughs> that is actually a good point. It's like being famous in America, but not even speaking English. That that would be pretty strange. That well, first of all, I speak only Cantonese. Yeah. So I mean, there is quite a different as far as pronunciation and things like that go. So somebody else's voice is used, right? For definitely, you? definitely. <laughs> you just make the words. Doesn't that sound strange when you go to the movies, especially in, in Hong Kong, in your own town, and you see yourself with somebody else's voice? Well, not really, you see, because most of the Mandarin picture done here are dubbed anyway. They're dubbed anyway? Anyway. I mean, disregard. I mean, they shoot without sound. <laughs> so it doesn't, you know, make any difference. Your lips never quite make the right words, do they? Oh. It's probably spark up some debate amongst the wheel booth about dub versus sub, right? In films. <laughs> Let's continue. The, yeah, well, well, that's where the difficulty lies, you see. I mean, in order to, because the Cantonese have a different way of saying things, you know, I mean, different from the Mandarin. Yeah. So I have to find, like, something similar to that and keep a kind of a feeling going behind that, something that matching the Mandarin do. Like the Does old it sound complicated? Days. Like the old silent days. But I... Hmm, that's actually kind of interesting. Now that I think about it, I don't know about, I guess, ch Chinese culture per se, but at least like, in, um, like, I guess, like parts of India, 
And even, like, it's like Pakistan. Realistically, there's like a bunch. I think it's one of the places with the most languages, right? Or one of the most languages, right? And um, even though I guess they live in this one area, the languages sound somewhat similar, but they're not exactly the same, you know. So maybe that's what it might be. That's what I'm guessing. I gather in the in the movies made here, the dialogue is pretty stilted anyway. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, uh, see, to me, a motion picture is motion. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you got to keep the dialogue down to the minimum. Did you go to, did you look at many Mandarin movies before you started uh, playing yes, in the first one? Yes, class? yes, What did you think of them when you saw them? Quality-wise, I mean, I have to admit yeah. that it's not quite up to the standard. However, it is growing and it is getting higher and higher and going to toward that standard, that what I would term quality. They say the secret of your success in that movie, uh, The Big Boss, which yeah. was such a success here and rocketed you to stardom in Asia, was that you did your own fighting. Uh, as an expert in the, in the various martial arts mm -hmm. in China, what did you think of the fighting that you saw in the movies that you studied before you became a star? Now we're getting into the important topic, fighting. Well, I mean, definitely in the beginning, I had no intention uh, or, or whatsoever that what I, what I was practicing and what I'm still practicing now would lead to this yeah, <laughs> to know. begin with. Uh, but martial art has a very, very deep meaning as far as my life is concerned because uh, as an actor, as a martial artist, as a human being, all these I have learned from martial art. Maybe for our audience who doesn't know what it means, you might explain exactly right. what you mean right. by martial art. Right. Uh, martial art include all the combative arts like karate or judo. karate, judo, Chinese kung fu or Chinese boxing, whatever you call it. Uh, all those. It's interesting. You know, he mentioned, he mentioned like Chinese kung fu. And believe it, or, believe it or not, one of his actual and only books that he actually published, right, was actually Chinese, like, Gung Fu, right? Just an interesting fact. You see, like, Aikido, Kori, I can go on and on and on. But it's a competitive form of fighting. I mean, it's not, some of them became sport, but some of them are still not. I mean, they use, for instance, kicking to the groin, jabbing fingers at the eyes, and things like that. I would say overall, that's actually a pretty good description of what martial arts actually is. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good description, I would say. Although, um, obviously, he talks about, like, sport versus, I guess, self-defense. That's more so what he's addressing here. No wonder you're successful in the <laughs> Chinese movies. They're full of this kind of action anyway. They needed a guy like you could... Violence, man. <laughs> so you didn't have to use a double when you moved into the motion no, picture no. world here. You did it all yourself. Right. Can you break five or six uh, pieces of wood with your hand or your foot? I'll probably break my hand and foot. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Actually, now that I remember, I, I do remember Bruce Lee actually wasn't biggest fan of breaking boards so yeah i mean you probably did not train in terms of trying to break boards but tell me a little bit uh, you set up a school in hollywood didn't you for people like yes. uh, james garner and steve mcqueen and the others yes why would they want to learn chinese martial art because of a movie role not really i mean uh, most of them you see uh to me uh, at least the way that when i mean when i teach it all type of knowledge ultimately means self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they are coming in to, I mean, for, and ask me to teach them not so much of how to defend themselves or how to do somebody in. What he said about how all forms of knowledge is self-knowledge. It actually reminds me of this um, Muhammad Iqbal quote. And he said something like, you know, like inner, I mean, I'm probably going to butcher the quote, but basically he said something about how inner experience, 
right, is only one source of knowledge, right? And I think martial arts, realistically, is probably the highest form of that, you know, inner experience of knowledge. Rather, they want to learn to express themselves through some movement, be it anger, be it uh, determination, or whatsoever. So, in other words, what I'm saying, therefore, is that he is paying me to show him, in combative form, the art of expressing the human body. Which is acting, in a sense, isn't it? Hmm, that's interesting. Martial arts, pretty much. And if you know Bruce Lee pretty well, this is actually pretty well known of him. That martial arts is actually a form of self expression, which obviously I agree with. Well, or it would be useful too for an actor to have it's, a... I mean, I might, it, it <clears throat> might sound too philosophical, but it's an acting, acting, or acting, unacting. If you. You've lost me. <laughs> <laughs> I have, right? For those of you that actually don't understand this, actually, I have a couple of Bruce Lee's books. I'm going to be right back and bring them. I'll be right back. Yeah, so I'm back. I brought you several Bruce Lee's books that I just you know, really love a lot, honestly. Obviously, the Chinese Kung Fu book that I mentioned. This is actually his. This is the actual only book that he officially published himself, right? Every other book that you see that says Bruce Lee, right? Or actually his notes, right? And like, it's mostly like John Little, basically like compiling those notes and making them into a book, nicely formatted and stuff. This is an actual book that he read. Right. I would not recommend reading this for a beginner because right, even a lot of advanced people would like miss a lot of stuff in this, to be honest. But unless you don't have knowledge of like like forms or katas as they're called, right, or pumse, right? Unless you don't really know about that, you're gonna have a really hard time about understanding this stuff. Right. And of course I have my notes <laughs> filled up. Right. But this is actually a really good advance. It's like it's like calculus from martial arts. But this is the book that I was going to refer to, Striking Thoughts. Right. And um, of course, I have my notes in this too. But the thing he's mentioned about acting and unacting, right? He talks about that concept a lot in this book specifically, right? And... Um, how there's like kind of a dichotomy between the two. That's interesting. Right. Uh, you know, the reason I got this book is because I thought it was about striking. But really, um, it's actually about like philosophical thoughts, which I guess is the funny thing, striking thoughts, right? But yeah, let's, let's continue. Just thought I'd put that out there. So what I'm saying, actually, you see, I mean, it's a combination of both. I mean, here it is natural instinct and here is control you are to combine the two in harmony not if you have one to the extreme wait we gotta re listen to that that was a gem right there the natural instinct and here is control both i mean here it is the natural instinct and here is control you are to combine the two in harmony not if you have one to the extreme, you will be very unscientific. If you have another to the extreme, you become all of a sudden a mechanical man, no longer a human being. So you, it is a successful combination of both. So therefore, it is not only, I mean, so therefore it's not pure naturalness or unnaturalness. The ideal is unnatural naturalness or natural unnaturalness. <laughs> Ying yang, eh? You're right, man, that's it. <laughs> That right there honestly that was actually like that was a gem right there it's high level stuff but it applies really well to martial arts honestly and um the way i am at least thinking about it is that you know a lot of fighters i think they get really fixated on these combos and these drills right and kind of like mechanical like he said right then there are some fighters that are a bit like too flowy right and they don't really have any structure to their way of fighting, 
right? All right, there's a two extremes basically, right? And basically, he's saying is that the best is to combine the two, right? And basically, right, the natural naturalness, right? The natural instincts of humans and the mechanical aspect, I guess, right? Right? And then you basically combine them into this, like, ultimate, like, amalgamation, basically. Right? Really, like, if you pay attention to that, uh, as a martial artist, you will definitely, like, excel a lot more. Yeah, one of your students, um, James Coburn, played uh, in a movie called Iron Man Flint, in which he used karate. Is that what he learned from you? Uh, he learned it after... Oh, he went not, he, oh, yeah. after he played in the Army. Right, so. right. You see, actually, I do not teach, you know, karate because I do not believe in styles anymore. I mean, I do not believe that there is such thing as, like, Chinese way of fighting or the, or the Japanese way of fighting or whatever way of fighting because unless human beings have three arms and four legs, we will have a different form of fighting. Mm. But basically, we have only two hands and two feet. So styles tends to uh, 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 not only separate men, you know, because they have their own doctrines, and then the doctrine became the gospel truth, you know, that you cannot change, you know. And, but if you do not have styles, if you just say, well, here, here I am, you know, as, uh, as a human being, how can I express myself totally and completely? Now, that way, you won't create a style, because style is a crystallization, you know? I mean, that way, it's a process of continuing growth. You talk about... Uh... That right there. Not creating a style. Basically being styleless, right? Because that, that honestly is kind of a problem in martial arts. And even, like, nowadays, like... I feel like a lot of people they try to rep whatever martial art that they like they try to do right or they can't they come from a striking background or a grappling background right right and they kind of like have this blind faith right because like realistically a lot of people started off with a certain martial art right whether that's brazilian jiu-jitsu or like karate or something right right and they really um in a way just and make it their personality trait that that is what they are, and they are some part of everything else, right? But uh, mostly it's like famous, like this is very basically like mostly like Ji Kondo, like one on one right here, right? The idea of discarding the idea of styles, right, and adapting, taking what is useful and rejecting what is not, right, and making uniquely what is your own. I mean, that's basically loosely quote. But that really much applies to what he's saying. The Chinese boxing, how does it differ from, say, our kind of boxing? Well, first we use the feet. Uh -huh, that's, that's and then start. we use the elbow. <laughs> and you use the thumb too? <laughs> <laughs> you name it, man. We you use, use it all. <laughs> you have to, you see, because, I mean, that is the expression of the human body. I mean, the f everything. I mean, you know, not just the hand. And when you're talking about combat, well, I mean, if, if it... If it is a sport, now now you're talking about something else. You have regulations, yeah. you have rules, but when you're talking about fight, what's interesting about this, right? And I'll and I'll go back to it a little bit. But basically, it's interesting how we mentioned the difference between, I guess, Chinese boxing, right, and it's Western boxing, right? Boxing, obviously, Western boxing is mostly just the hands, right? Right. That's really the only thing you can attack with, pretty much. In Chinese boxing, like he said, like pretty much the whole human body is a weapon. It's interesting, but you gotta go a little back to what he was saying. Uh, now you're talking about something else. You have regulations, yeah. you have rules, but when you're talking about fighting, as it is oh, rules. with no rules, Not real fighting. Well, then, baby, you better train every part of your body. And when you do punch, now I'm leaning forward a little bit, yeah. hoping not to hurt any camera angle. Yeah. I mean, you gotta put the whole hip into it and snap it and get all your energy in there and make this into a weapon. I don't want to tangle you in any dark. <laughs> that, right. Yes, I mean, just think about it. What you're saying basically is that, in a way, you just gotta like not be one-dimensional you gotta you gotta train everything 
Right, and of course that's going to take a minute, right, but it's definitely going to make you a lot more well-rounded right, as a martial artist, right? Because the biggest fall any fighter has is, right, or any martial artist really is, being one-dimensional, right? Because you're so easy to exploit if you're one-dimensional. I can come at you from anywhere except for that one point, okay? Right? That's why. No, you, but you came at me pretty fast there. What is the difference between Chinese boxing and what we see these young men doing at 8 o'clock every morning on the rooftops uh -huh. in the parks called shadow boxing, which they're always... Well, actually, yeah. you see, that is part of Chinese boxing. It is. There are so many schools. Everybody schools. here seems to be, you know, going like this all the time. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm very shape. glad. I'm very glad to see that because at least somebody is caring for their own body, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a good sign. Well, it's a kind of a slow form of exercise, which is called Tai Chi Chuan. Uh -huh. I'm speaking Mandarin just now. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, it's tai, chi, tai Chi, right? It basically looks like, it's kind of like the Katos, and it's kind of like a slow form of shadow boxing in a way. Drilling. Basically. Cantonese Tai Te Kun, <laughs> okay? I see. And uh, it's more of an exercise for the elderly. Not so much for the Give young. me a demonstration. Show me. Can you do a little bit of it? Just so I mean, the hand-wise, it's very slow. Oh, is it? And you push it out, but all the time you are keeping the continuity going. Bending, stretching, everything. You know, suppose, you know, I mean, you, you just keep it moving. It's like a ballet dancer there. Yeah, it is. I mean, to... to it's kind of, honestly, like, the way I'm seeing it, it's kind of like hand fighting, either in grappling, right? Or, um, or even in Muay Thai, where they're clinching up with each other. That's what it looks like. And it even, to a certain extent, for sure, it could be parrying, right? That's for sure. To them, you see, the idea is just keep it moving. It's like a ballet dancer there. Yeah, it is. I mean, to, to them, you see, the idea is running water never grows stale. So you got to just keep on flowing. Of, of all your <clears> students, <throat> famous, James Garner, Steve McC that right there. Right, I mean, because especially in like this, like grappling, I guess, but this is obviously Tai Chi, what are you talking about, right? But even in grappling or in the thigh clinch, it's very important to not be super rigid, right? And kind of have to be a little loose in order to get your grips correctly. So yeah, I mean, you gotta be like water, like he said. Queen, Lee Marvin, James Coburn, Roman Polanski, which was the best, who, who adapted best to this oriental form of exercise and defense? Well, um, depending, okay? Now, as a fighter, Steve, Steve McQueen, now, he is good in that department because that son of a gun got the toughness in him. Yeah, I you mean, see it he, on the screen. I mean, he would say, all right, baby, here I am, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and he'll do it. Yeah. Now, James Coburn is a peace-loving man. Yeah, I met him. Right? I mean, yeah. you've met him. I mean, he's really, really nice. I mean, yeah. super m mellow and all that. Yeah, I mean, is. you know, I mean, now, he appreciates the philosophical part of it. Therefore, his understanding of it is deeper than Steve. So it's really hard to say. You see what I'm saying yeah. now? I yeah, this is a really good point because... Okay, I don't know. I see. This is a really good point because I don't know why, but like a lot of martial artists, for some reason, they, um, right, especially in MMA specifically, they think that your only, your opinion only matters if you are a fighter, right? But I would argue that's not really the case because if you look at it, some of the best coaches, even for MMA, I've actually surprisingly never fought in MMA, funny enough. There's no old-timers in MMA. Granted, it's a young sport, right? But, like, I'll give you an example, like, Frost Sahabi, right? I don't think he's ever fought in M MMA, right? He's never made it to the UFC, but... He definitely has a way better understanding than a lot of fighters in the UFC, for sure. Like, hands down. You know? I would even argue that he would probably beat a lot of them, honestly. 
I mean, it's, it, I mean, it's different. So, so that's, I mean, depending on what you, what you see in it. Interesting. That, uh, we don't, in our world, and have... Oh, just give me a second. Cut this part out. Okay, it's still recording. Just you know, wanted to make sure. Okay. Getting back to it. Interesting. That, uh, we don't... In what you see in it. Interesting that uh, we don't, in our world, and haven't since the days of the Greeks who did, combine philosophy and art with sport. But quite clearly, the Oriental attitudes of the three are facets of the same things. Man. That is actually somewhat, somewhat true to an extent, but the ancient Greeks, at least, they kind of did combine the... Um, Sports, obviously, like pancreation, and like you know, with some philosophy, not exactly, not to the level that you know, um, the Eastern philosophers did per se, but to an extent, he's right, though. Listen, you see, really, to me, okay, to me, ultimately, martial art means honestly expressing yourself. Now, it is very difficult to do. I mean, it is, it is easy for me to put on a show and be cocky yeah. and be flooded with a cocky feeling and then yeah. feel like pretty cool and all that. Or I can f make all kinds of phony thing, you see what I mean? Blinded by it. Or I can show you some f really fancy movement. But to express oneself honestly, not lying to oneself, and to express myself honestly, not that, my friend, is very hard to do and you have to train you have to keep your reflexes so that when you want it it's there when you want to move you're moving and when you move you are determined to move not taking one inch not anything less than that if i want to punch i'm gonna do it man and i'm gonna do it you see so i mean so that is the type of thing you have to train yourself into it to become one with the you think yeah this is very is. unwestern this attitude i want to ask you about your movie that is actually kind of interesting because, yeah, because I do feel like what he is saying, a lot of fighters, they might really be, um, as I guess I like to call it, gun shy, right? Is that they're really, like, when they're either hard sparring or fighting, per se, right? They are hesitant to m make a move just because they're so afraid of the you know, consequences, right, that could come with it, right, but if they had properly drilled, right, it could, it's like right there, like you said, you know, so that's why it's important to drill, right, and to practice, very good point. ...in TV career, but first, yeah, this is very unwestern, this attitude, I want to ask you about your movie and TV career, but first, uh, we'll take a break, then I'll be back with Bruce Lee. I've been talking to Bruce Lee mainly about the Chinese martial arts, which include things like Chinese boxing, karate, and judo, which is what he taught when he was in Hollywood. After he left the University of Washington, where he studied, of all things, philosophy, if you can believe that. <laughs> he did, but that, uh, perhaps you understand why he, the two go together from the first half of this program. And you can perhaps understand how he got into films. He knew a lot of actors, but I'm told that you got the job on the Green Hornet, where you played Cato the chauffeur, mainly because you're the only Chinese-looking guy who could pronounce the name of the leading character, Britt Reed. <laughs> I meant that as a joke, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a heck of a name, man. Yeah. I mean, every time I said it at that time, I was super conscious. I mean, really, now, that's another interesting thing, huh? Let's say if you learn to speak Chinese. Yeah. And it's very, I mean, it's not difficult to learn and speak the word. The hard thing, the difficult thing, it's behind what is the meaning, what brought on the expression and feelings behind those words. Like when I first arrived in the United States and I look at a Caucasian and I really would not know whether he was putting me on yeah. or is he really angry because, because we have different ways of reacting of to it. See, those are the difficult things, you see. It's almost as if you came upon a strange race 
Or a smile didn't mean what it does to us. Yeah. In fact, a smile doesn't always mean the same, does it? Of course not. Yeah, I just thought of that. It's actually interesting. Cultures do have, I guess, like you said, differences. And uh, I just remember, I forgot what country it is, but somewhere in Eastern Europe, I think, or it's either like Bosnia or Albania or something, where uh, nodding, I guess, like, which would normally mean yes everywhere else. But in that country specifically, it actually means no. Right? And this would mean no everywhere else. But in that specific country, it would mean yes, basically. <laughs> right, so it's flipped. So, yeah, I mean, there is that, I guess, a cultural difference in a way. Tell me about the brig break when you played in Long Street. Uh, I must ah, tell the audience that uh, it. Bruce Lee had a bit part or a, a supporting role in, in, in the Long Street series, and this had an enormous effect on the audience. What was it? Well, you see, um, the w title of that, ep that particular episode of Long Street is called The Way of the Intercepting Fist. Now, I think the successful ingredient in it was because I was being Bruce Lee. Yourself. Uh, myself, right. And did that part, just express myself, like I say, honestly express myself at that time. And I, because of that, I, I, I brought, you know, favorable mentioning in like New York Times, uh, which says like the Chinaman, uh, who incidentally came off uh, quite convincingly enough to earn himself a television series and so on and so on and so forth. And Can you remember the lines by uh, Sterling Sullivan to the key lines? Were He's one of my students, you know that? Was he too? Yes. <laughs> about everybody is your student. But you read, there were some lines that expressed your philosophy. I don't know if you remember them or not. Oh, you? I remember that. I That's said, here. this is what it is, okay? You're talking to Long Street, played by James Francesca. I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend, like that. See, bro was spitting right there. Like, <laughs> I remember hearing that line when I was like, oh, a couple years ago when I like, Really young, obviously. Like, I mean, it's probably his most famous quote. But yet, yeah, it's like literally one of the best concepts of mar um, two martial arts, right? Mm. Being like water, right? Being fluid, not crashing. Like, right? such a good concept, honestly. I see. <laughs> no, I see. I get the. Be water, my friend. Like that, you see? <laughs> oh, I see. I get the idea. Uh -huh. I, I get the, the power behind it. So, now, uh, two things have happened. First, there's a pretty good chance that you'll get a TV series in the States called The Warriors, in which you use, what, the martial arts uh, well, in a Western setting? Uh, that was the original idea. Now, yeah. Paramount, you know, I did Long yeah. Street for Paramount, and Paramount wants me to be in a television series. On the other hand, Warner Brother wants me to be in another one, but both of them, I think, they want me to be in a modernized type of a thing. And they think that Western idea is out. But whereas you would I use, want... You want to do the Western, eh? I want, because you see, I mean, how else can you justify all these punching and kicking and violence yeah. except in that period of the West? I mean, in, the, in nowadays, I mean, you don't go around on the street kicking people or punching people. Because if you do, yeah, that's it. I the mean, gun. I don't care how good you are, you know. But this is true. All Such a good point. Regardless of how good of a martial art is, martial artist you are, a twenty will always put you down, right? Never fight people on the street. Also of the Chinese. That's it. I mean, gun. I don't care how good you are, you know. But this is true also of the Chinese dramas, which are mainly costume dramas. They're all full of blood and gore over here. You oh, know? you mean here? Yeah. yeah. Well, unfo unfortunately, you see, uh, uh, I hope that the picture I am in 
would either explain why the violence was done, whether right or wrong or whatnot. But unfortunately, <laughs> pictures, most of them here, are done mainly just for the sake of violence. You know what I mean? Like, you know, fighting for 30 minutes, get stabbed 50 times. And but I'm fascinated. Uh, well, let me I give you your microphone <laughs> back. I'm fascinated that you came back. Uh, I am a martial artist. You came though. back to Hong Kong on the verge of success in Hollywood and full of it. And suddenly, on the strength of one picture, you become a superstar. Everybody knows you. You have to take. You have to change your phone number. You get mobbed in the streets. Uh, now, what are you going to do? Are you going to are, are you going to be able to live in both worlds? Are you going to be a superstar here, or, or one in the states, or both? Well, let me say this. First of all, uh, uh, the word superstar really turned me off, and I'll tell you why. Because the word star, man, is an illusion is something what the public calls you. You should look upon oneself as an actor, man. I mean, you would be very pleased if somebody say, hey man, you are a super actor. It is much better than, you know, superstar. Yeah, Therefore, you've I got to admit that you are a superstar. You're not gonna, if you're gonna give me the truth. I am, now, I'm honestly saying this, okay? Yes, I have been very successful, Yeah. okay? But I, I mean, I think the word star is, is I mean, I, I do not look upon myself as a star. I, I really don't. I mean, believe me, man, yeah. when I say it. I mean, I'm not saying it because well, I... What are you going to do? Let's get back to the question. Okay. <laughs> are you going to stay in Hong Kong and be famous? Or are you going to go to the United States and be famous? I guess that was... This humble attitude of Bruce Lee. So are you going to try and eat, are you going to stay in Hong Kong and be famous? Or are you going to go to the United States and be famous? Or are you going to try and eat I'm, your cake and have it too? I am going to do both because yeah. you see, I have already made up my mind that in the United States, I think something about the Oriental, the, I mean the true Oriental should be shown. Hollywood sure as heck hasn't. You better believe it, man. I mean, it's always that pigtail and bouncing around, chop chop, you know, with the eyes slant and all that. And I think that's very, very out of. Is it date, true that man. you were the first uh, job you had was being cast as Charlie Chan's number one? Yeah, boy? number one son. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they, they never made they, a movie. No, 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 no. They were gonna make it into like a new Chinese James Bond type of a oh, thing. I now see. that you know the old man Chan is yeah. dead, Charlie is dead, and his son oh, is carrying on. But they didn't do that. No. Batman came along, you see, because, oh, and then everything was started to be going into that, you know, that the kind of, uh, yeah. Which you were in. But, is I, it? I mean, by the way, I did a really terrible job in that, I have to say. Really? You didn't oh, like yourself? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see it. Let me ask you, however, about the, the problems that you face as a Chinese hero in an American series. Have people come up in the industry and said, well, we don't know how the audience are going to take a non-American. Well, such question has been raised. In fact, it is, it is, it is being discussed. And that is why the warrior is probably is not going to be on. I see. You see, because uh, unfortunately, uh, such thing does exist in this world, you see, like, I don't know, certain part of the country, right? Where like, they think that business-wise, it's a risk. And I don't blame them, and I don't blame them. I mean, in the same way, it's like in Hong Kong, if a foreigner come and, be, and became a star, if I were the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, mon the man with the money, I probably would have my own worry of whether or not the acceptance would be there. But that's all right, because if you, if you honestly express yourself, it doesn't matter, see? Because are you, you uh, how about the other side of the coin? Is it possible that you are a good answer to that type of dilemma, honestly. I liked it. I liked it, honestly. That was actually pretty good. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. As long as you have peace of mind. Right? And on it, as you keep saying, expressing yourself. It's a good way of looking at it. I mean, you're fairly hip. Because are you... Uh, <laughs> how about the other side of the coin? Is it possible that you are... I mean, you're fairly hip. And fairly <laughs> Americanized. Are you too Western uh, for Oriental audiences? Do you think? Uh, oh man, like <laughs> how? <laughs> I have been. Yeah. I have been criticized for that. You have, eh? Oh I yes, definitely. So. Uh, 
Well, let me say this. When I do the Chinese film, I'll try my best not to be as American as I, you know, have been adjust to for the last 12 years in the States. And, but when I go back to the States, it seems to be the other way around. You know You're what too I mean? exotic, eh? Yeah, man. I mean, they're trying to get me to do too many things that are really for the sake of being exotic. You, 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 do you understand what I'm trying to oh, say? Oh, sure. <laughs> so it's really, I mean, it's When a, you live in both worlds, you, there's, it, it brings us problems as well as its advantages, right. and you've got both. Time to go to a commercial. I'll be back in a moment with Bruce Lee. Let me ask you whether the change in attitude on the part of the Nixon administration towards China has helped your chances <laughs> of starring in an American TV series. I remember this was during that time period. I guess so, yeah. Well, first of all, this happened before that. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think that things of Chinese will be quite interesting for the next few years. I mean, not that I'm politically, you know, inclining toward anything. You no, know, I you understand, understand that. I'm but I just wondering. But I mean, I mean, once the opening of 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 China, you know, I mean, that it will bring more understanding, yeah, more things that are hey, like different, you know, and maybe in the contrast of comparison, some new thing might grow. So therefore, I mean, it's a very rich period to be in. I mean, like if I were born, let's say, uh, forty years ago, yeah, if I have a thought in my mind, I said. Boy, I'm gonna star in a movie or star in a television series in America. Well, that might be a vague dream, but I think right now, maybe. Man. It's, it's probably even more true today than it was back then. So you know, it's always good to take advantage of well, whatever opportunities that come your way, especially when it comes to things you want to pursue. You still think of yourself Chinese, or do you ever think of yourself as maybe? Man. You still think of yourself Chinese, or do you ever think of yourself as North American? You, you, you know what I want to think of myself as a human being, because I mean I don't want to sound like you know as Confucius say, but under the sky, under the heaven, man, there is but one family. It just so happened, man, that people are different. Okay, we gotta go. Thank you, Bruce Lee, for coming hey, here. Thank, thank you, you for yeah. watching. Thank you. That was a pretty good ending right there. Yeah. And I, I am wondering if Confucius did actually say that. We'll have to look into it. Well, thank you, Bruce Lee, for coming hey, here. Thank, thank you, you for yeah. watching. Thank you. You've been watching Bruce Lee on The Pierre Burton Show, a half-hour program of conversation, opinion, and debate. This is Bernard Cowan speaking. That was actually a pretty good interview, I will be honest. It's just a shame we didn't get more of it, you know. I like a full, like, two-hour Joe Rogan podcast. That was actually shorter than the episode that I host, funny enough. Because mine are usually about, like, 40 minutes. And this was, we said 30 minutes, but that's probably with the ads. So in actuality, like, it's 25 minutes. But honestly, like... Well, he dropped a lot of good ideas there. And he was like a pioneer in terms of like, as a martial artist, you know, he, it is something that everyone should look into and like, his like, his um, way of looking at martial arts was very much kind of like the Socratic method. You know, if you know Socrates and the Socr Socratic method, right? I'm probably going to butcher it, but basically what it comes down to is that, you know, you discuss ideas, right, or you debate them, right, you discuss them, and then you find out what's kind of true, right, and you do this with a bunch of people, 
first you do it with yourself, of course, and then you eventually go to someone else, you do it with them, and eventually you find out the truth, but in the same way, you could do that with martial arts, and we know like, Bruce Lee would obviously test his theories, right, and this is in a time period when, you know, things weren't as convenient, right, like, as the internet today, but it's still amazing that he was able to, um, get as far as he did in terms of the philosophical aspect of martial arts. And of course, he was a very good martial artist as well. You know? But that basically concludes this uh, breakdown of Bruce Lee's interview. You know? For everyone that enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe. And until next time, peace.